Okay, uh, well, good evening, everybody. For those of you that from it outside the university that don't know me, I'm uh, Mark Ormrod, Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Provost, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to uh, this evening's inaugural lecture, particularly those of you who say who have come uh, from, from outside the university, as well as academic and professional colleagues from within the university. Particularly warm welcome to uh, Clifford's mum and, and partner who are here, here tonight, as well as, say, external uh, guests. And the role of inaugurals at, at Keeley is really twofold. Firstly, to to kind of show the new the new professor's area of expertise, in this case, uh, social psychology, uh, and also as a, a way to showcase uh, profile research at Keele and 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 the particular discipline of the the speaker. So before I hand over to the speaker, I'm just going to say a few words of biography about about Clifford uh, Stott. So Clifford graduated in psychology from Plymouth Polytechnic in 1988, and this was then followed by PhD in social psychology on the intergroup dynamics of crowd behaviour at Exeter University, which is awarded in 1996. And then following his PhD, Clifford held lectureships and senior lectureships at Universities of Bath, Abate and Liverpool before he moved to, Liver uh, to the School of Law at uh, Leeds University in 2013, where he was a principal research fellow in security and justice. And then in 2016, we, we advertised for and, uh, a chair in social psychology and, and we appointed Clifford to professor of social psychology within the School of Psychology. Since coming to uh, Keel, Cliff's made a significant contribution not just to the School of Psychology but much wider to the institution, even in the relatively short time that he has been, been here, particularly driving and establishing Police, uh, Keel's Police Academic Collaboration, KPAC, which is a major interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary research centre, which, which Cliff's the co-director of. Just to give you a bit of background of, of Clifford's research, it revolves around crowd psychology, riots and public order policing. And within that research, he works very closely with external organisations at a regional level, a national level and an international level, working with police forces, with governments and with football authorities across the world. It's fair to say that his research is not only internationally leading, but it's had huge impact and it's been acknowledged in policy documents on the policing of crowds issued by the Council of Europe and the European Union and his research underpins policy reforms of public order policing in the UK, in Sweden, Denmark and Australia. And reflecting the kind of the influence and impact of, of Cliff's research, in 2014 uh, he was awarded the Celebrating Impact First Prize for Outstanding Impact on Public Policy by the Economic and Social Sciences Research Council, the ESRC, which uh, is really impressive, huge accolade in terms of the impact of Cliff's research. And in 2015 the ESRC also acknowledged his research as one of the top 50 landmark research achievements in its 50-year history and in the same year he was awarded the University of Leeds Vice-Chancellor's Impact Prize for Social Sciences, so clearly hugely impactful research. So in tonight's lecture uh, Cliff is going to focus on the nature of crowds to illustrate their importance for social theory and policy and the lecture will outline a conceptual approach for understanding the psychology that drives collective action in crowd events and highlight how his research has helped transform understanding of riots and football hooliganism. So can I therefore formally welcome Clifford Stott, Professor of Psychology, Social Psychology, and invite him to present his inaugural lecture tonight, The Social Psychology of Crowds, Ideas, Identity and Impact. Thank you, Mark, for a wonderful introduction, and uh, thank you all for being here, because my biggest fear was that I was going to be speaking to my mum and the DVC on their own, so uh, the fact that you're populating this room is perhaps the most significant thing going on here tonight. Um, it's a, obviously an honour to, to stand up here and give an inaugural lecture, but the content of that, I think, is important to reflect on, on the trajectory of my career, to... To, to give some ideas about the relationship between theory and practice and the centrality of crowds 
in the context of the social sciences and of the social and political life of the societies uh, that we live in uh, and populate. But I think one of the most important things we need to do first is, is to recognise that crowds aren't an aberration. But when we, when we explore people's understandings of crowds, we, what we tend to find is uh, a common sense, an understanding that people share, uh, an, a, a, an understanding that populates the discourses of, of, of politics and the media about the nature of, uh, of crowds, that talks to us about crowds as if they are nothing but an aberration, that their psychology that drives behaviour within crowds is somehow pathological and a pathological intrusion into normally civilised uh, ways of behaving. And that there's this thing that we call mob psychology. And the idea here is that when we get into crowds, when people populate crowds, that somehow they undergo some kind of psychological dysfunction. And as a consequence, ringleaders or troublemakers can populate crowds as well. And they can whip crowds up into a frenzy. And that's kind of why we get violence. And that's the explanation that's often uh, given to us, along with the idea that crowds also populate uh, people who are predisposed towards criminality, hooligans, troublemakers, extremists, and so on. But both of these narratives function together to produce a picture of the crowd that is fundamentally pathological, that somehow that there's this aberrant intrusion into normally civilised life. And one of the things that my work does is it focuses on that common sense understanding to try to disrupt it, to try to highlight the extent to which the way in which we think about crowds is fundamentally wrong. And what we need to do is to draw on an informed sense of how and why crowds work like they do. Uh, that draws on a different notion of their underlying psychology. Now, when we look at these common sense assumptions, one of the things that we need to understand is that they draw from essentially the origins of the social sciences. In the rapid industrialization of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, cities began to expand exponentially. They exploded in terms of their population. An urban society became a reality for the first time. And in that process, the masses were born. Uh, the urban proletariat was, brought, was born. And these uh, people didn't have a franchise. They had no vote. They had appalling living and working conditions and their only capacity to influence the political status quo was through mobilisation in the crowd. And that problem of urban disorder became one of the original foundational propositions that the social sciences were born to try to understand, mass urban life. And we live with social sciences now precisely because they were born out of that project. And crowd and crowd psychology was central to that project, not some sideshow, but actually fundamental to it. And there were some very important and influential academics. Uh, this guy here, Hippolyte Taine, in uh, 1874, wrote a big treatise on uh, the political situation in France. Uh, the instability that was riven uh, through that society is a function of the revolutionary crowd. And it's in that historical treatise that crowd psychology in its modern form was essentially born. But we shouldn't assume that crowd psychology uh, was some enlightened attempt to understand some underlying truth. Because in fact it was actually born as a, a technology of social control. The, the idea that the crowd was a social and political problem was fundamental to late 19th century France. So it was not a question of understanding it, it was a question of controlling it. And that political project of control, understanding the psychology of crowds and how to harness their power and opportunity was essentially an ideological project that led into the great dictators and the mass movements of uh, the fascists in the 1930s and so on. And crowd psychology was fundamental to that process the ideas that were born in, in, in crowd psychology uh, were ideas that were uh, focused on the crowd as some kind of pathological intrusion, as an aberration, uh, where through anonymity uh, people became open to hypnotic-like suggestion and ideas could spread through a crowd without control, almost disease-like. 
And the idea of social influence as contagion, and its link to the idea of contagion of diseases, is no accident. The ideas that were driving revolutionary crowds were seen by the ruling classes to be like a disease, an attack on the established order that was pathological to the long-term project of industrial capitalisation. And where we see that issue of the crowd and its uh, intellectual project of crowd psychology and the notion that that intellectual project could harness an ability for political leaders to mobilise crowds in the direction of nationalism and away from uh, socialism and communism, we begin to understand the ideological dimension uh, to crowd psychology, that crowd psychology isn't just uh, the pursuit of some underlying scientific truth, but something that has profound social and political consequences. Because these ideas about crowd psychology are important not just in their own right, but because they feed our understandings of how to manage crowds, how to react to crowds. And that the idea of the crowd as a pathological intrusion survives and is maintained in popular discourse, not necessarily because of its validity, but because of the way that it functions to legitimise repression. That if you see the crowd as a disease-like intrusion into society, then any attempt to control and suppress the crowd is rendered more legitimate as a, may, as a means through which uh, the state can uh, strip the crowd of its meaning and give legitimacy to these kinds of repressive practices. And that's a very, very important thing to understand. And we see them uh, all over the media discourse around the 2011 riots, the notion of uh, mob psychology threatening the stability of normalised, civilised democracy and that the solution to this is to arm the police. It's to move in a direction where we applaud and uh, give uh, power to discourses around the need to empower the police to be reactionary. And these relationships are at the heart of the birth of crowd psychology. And we need to understand that if we want to understand uh, the nature of why crowd psychology uh, in this form retains its popularity uh, when we think about uh, trying to find solutions to these kinds of problems. And our work on the crowd starts to attack this classical model. Uh, this classical model, born in the late 19th century, uh, rendering crowd uh, psychology as pathological also makes certain sorts of predictions. Because if crowd behaviour is driven by irrationality, it should be random. It shouldn't reflect meaning. It shouldn't reflect uh, social contextual conditions. But the problem is it does. Wherever we look at crowds, when they become significant politically, what we find is human behaviour collective behaviour that reflects a sense of identity in the social context. I've just recently been over in the Ukraine as part of an EU advisory mission uh, involved in a project of police reform in the UK trying to drive forward with a democratic form of policing. And central to uh, the situation in Ukraine uh, is this place, the, the, the Euromaidan. You may recall a few years back there was in 2014 uh, a revolution that led to, to um, uh, the uh, collapse of the Soviet puppet regime, the Russian puppet regime. And when we look at this crowd, what people do cannot be understood outside that context. It cannot be understood outside of a sense of these people uh, in terms of their identity, seeking democracy, seeking to uh, overturn a dictatorial set of laws and a dictatorial regime. Uh, and the patterns of what we see in that crowd can only be understood in, that, in those terms. And if we try to render that understanding or to construct that understanding in terms of this idea uh, that crowds are irrational, how on earth can we understand the normative pattern that we see so self-evidently in these crowds? So from the outset, the fundamental problem with classical notions of the crowd, with these common sense assumptions, is they simply don't explain the behaviour that they purport to explain. Now you have to forgive me here, but I am a behavioural scientist, I'm a psychologist. And wherever as a scientist we have a theory that doesn't explain the data, we have to reject it. By definition, that's what we do as scientists. So we can't, as scientists, accept a situation where the dominant theoretical model doesn't make sense of human behaviour. We have to move on from that in order to construct an understanding that does make sense, to build a theory that can explain, because it's our raison d'etre as, as scientists.
So for many, many years, the classical model has begun to disappear uh, from, uh, from the social sciences more generally, but it still retains its salience and prominence uh, in the popular, uh, popular explanations. And as I say, the big problem with this is that, that we can't explain the nature of collective action in crowd events. And I put this up here as, as a really good example of how that works and how central social structural reality, inequality and identity is to crowd action. Here is a, a recent demonstration, uh, I think last year, in, uh, in Iceland, where women left work 14% early to protest against pay differences in Iceland of 14%. How can you make sense of that without taking into account that there is a structural reality of inequality and the notion of identity or gender? You simply can't do it. It's so obvious, it's untrue. You don't need me as a social psychologist and a professor to expose that reality because it is so obviously self-evident in the nature of crowd action. Yet we never seem to ask that question. We never seem to confront uh, this discourse that is so popular uh, in social and political analyses and media-dominated analyses of, of, of particular types of riot. Now, that, that problem of a lack of explanatory power is and has been for many, many years also a problem within social psychology. And part of the issue here is the way in which psychology and social psychology tends to decontextualise uh, human behaviour and uh, reduce the explanation of human behaviour down to uh, subjective processes within uh, the minds of individuals. And this problem of explanatory power has been a feature of post-war social psychology. A good example of it is... Uh, uh, Milgram's analysis of uh, why people obey, obey pernicious authorities, which is a, a piece of research that was uh, developed to try to make sense of why it was that Germany as an otherwise civilised, educated people uh, allowed a situation to emerge of uh, the genocide in, in the Second World War. How was that possible? And we all live with the legacy of that particular uh, notion that they did it because they were following orders, that there's this natural tendency that people have to obey uh, authorities. And that's a general narrative that came out of the Milgram paradigm, a very famous social psychology uh, uh, project. Uh, but the problem is that social history doesn't really produce data that's significantly in line with that particular interpretation. The, the, uh, the organisations that perpetrated uh, the genocide in Eastern Europe, uh, in particular the Einsatzgruppen, uh, they, they weren't following orders. They were, they were actively pursuing an ideological project. There is no evidence of direct orders that they should perpetrate these atrocities. They did it on their own initiatives, and that's partly how it was made possible, precisely because the Nazis never really issued those kinds of orders. It was the implementation of an ideological project by people who were actively following that because they identified uh, with it. But this lack of explanatory power feeds into, in the 1970s, a crisis in social psychology, where European social psychologists began to recognise that there were some fundamental problems with theory in social psychology. And it's in that realisation or the crisis of social psychology uh, that social identity perspectives or social identity theory was born. And it was led to a large degree by this individual, a, 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 a Polish Jew who escaped uh, the, the concentration camps by posing as a French Gentile uh, during the Second World War, Henri Targefell. And he had a mission to try to address the way in which social psychological theory become disconnected from uh, the... Uh, uh, from the realities of, of, of social life. And his argument was that uh, we needed to understand why um, and we needed to develop theory that could uh, engage with contemporary uh, social issues. And I share, I share that view of how important engaging with social and political issues is. But the theoretical project that was born in that movement was a theoretical project about the nature of self that it started to talk to us about a different way of understanding who we are as people. That there's this dominant view that the thing about us is our individuality, 
that I'd be true to myself, and being true to myself is about being true to my idiosyncratic uh, personality and my uniqueness as an individual. Well, of course, that's true of us, but that's not only the thing that is important to us. We also share things that bind us together as well as uh, differentiate us, and that this social identity is equally important to who we are and a fundamental part of our self-concept. So while we can see ourselves as, as unique, we also can see ourselves in terms of our gender, that we're men and women, that we're uh, British, or uh, that uh, we uh, share national identity or political uh, affiliations and so on. So this project of understanding and reforming the nature of the way in which we understand ourselves is fundamental to the crowd psychology that we began to develop in order to try to overcome the limitations of the classic approach. And this relationship between crowds and identity is writ large right now. What is this other than a situation where people are mobilising around different versions of what identity is? Am I Spanish or Catalonian? And the behaviour of the crowds on the streets of Barcelona will be fundamental to the outcome of that question. Will Catalan become an independent nation? Will Spain descend into civil war? What will happen in terms of international relations is all dependent on the way in which those crowds behave over the coming weeks and months. And these expose the central relationship between politics, international relations, and crowds and crowd psychology. But at the heart of that is always this question of who am I and the nature of identity, because they're fundamentally uh, interlinked. So with crowd psychology then, what we're beginning to confront is a relationship between social structural realities and the nature of human subjectivity and the way in which that feeds into uh, action and collective action in the context of a crowd event. And that collective action demonstrates or uh, gives us um, uh, examples of behaviours that are socially structured, they're socially determined. But at the same time, when those crowds act, they create new social contexts, they bring about social change, or they mobilise to retain the status quo. Either way, that there is this problem of trying to theorise how human subjectivity can be both determined by, but also determining of, social context. And that's one of the fundamental questions of the social sciences. How can we theorise a nature of human subjectivity that can explain both the social determination uh, but also the human agency that feeds into uh, the creation of that socially structured reality? So you can see why, at some level, the crowd is at the heart of the social sciences and uh, uh, its uh, ideological, theoretical, academic and political project. And this social identity approach over the last 10 to 15 years has been led predominantly by, I would argue, Steve Reicher and Alex Haslam, two very prominent social psychologists, to relook at some of the classics of social psychology that are perpetuate in our textbooks about Zimbardo and his prison study, Milgram's uh, paradigm of obedience, to reinterpret them from a social identity perspective. But arguably one of the first projects that the social identity approach took on to try to achieve that was its analysis of the crowd. And this analysis of the crowd was born in the last wave of urban riots that we had uh, in the 90, summers of 1980 and 1981. Uh, there will be a few of us old enough in the room to remember uh, those particular riots, but it was the last time before 2011 uh, when urban riots spread across uh, English cities. And the social identity approach took on the classical uh, interpretations of these riots as aberrations and began to explore the capacity of the social identity approach to build a meaningful explanatory model that helped us to understand the normative structure uh, of those riots because it wasn't the case that those riots were random. They were actually very structured and very targeted and they targeted predominantly the police. And we now recognise, in the light of the formal inquiries that went on afterwards, that racist police practices were, were actually a very strong contributory factor uh, to why those riots came about. And the social identity approach helped us to begin to understand that. But moving on from that, where my PhD work began, was to try to uh, expand that original theoretical proposition to understand how crowds become violent. We could explain at this point what people were going to do when they became violent in a, in a riotous crowd. 
But we didn't really understand the dynamics of the transition from a peaceful crowd into a violent one. And my work uh, looked at that uh, particular uh, process. Um, uh, this is the poll tax riot in London in 1990. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but it was a very serious widespread riot that developed out of a demonstration against one of Margaret Thatcher's uh, uh, novel ideas called the community charge or the, or the poll tax. I was actually standing uh, in this location doing my research, watching this event evolve and develop. And from that ethnography, I began to understand where that riot came from. It didn't come from the crowd at all. It came from the police. It came from the actions of the police against the crowd that created the social contextual conditions whereby uh, the identity of the crowd changed in a way that became conducive to the support of collective violence. And that process we've seen in multiple crowd events goes something like this, that people saw themselves on that demonstration, they lived in a democracy, and they felt they had the right to peacefully protest. They were on that demonstration um, exercising that right, the police didn't see it like that. There was a sit-down protest outside Downing Street. The police saw this as a, a, a evidence that the crowd was exercising its natural tendency towards slipping into disorderly conduct. So they decided to undertake a dispersal exercise and drove uh, a, a police unit into the crowd and began arresting and baton striking road-mounted uh, police officers into that crowd. But of course, given that people in that crowd didn't see it themselves in that term, in those terms, they couldn't understand why the police were acting. Why are you doing this? You, you, this, this, is, this is about you. We are here to police, peacefully protest. So in that context of intergroup relationship, what we found was that people's identity changed. And it changes across two important dimensions. First, people come to see violence against the police as something understandable or legitimate. Well, we're defending our right to protest, aren't we? It's you that's doing something wrong. But also because the intervention by the police was relatively indiscriminate, a lot of people kept, became united in that sense of the world. And unity is power. So it shifted the power dynamic between people in the crowd and the police and allowed them to fight back. And what we see then is uh, an escalation uh, of disorder that comes about through psychological change that is rendered through the dynamics of intergroup interaction during a crowd event itself. And it's really that notion of identity as an intergroup process, as both a subjective uh, psychological process, but also a sociological process. That if we want to understand how identity works, we have to build a theory that is capable of understanding the sociology of identity as much as the psychology uh, and its subjectivity. So a truly social, social psychology. Now, a lot of people, they smirk and they grin and they say, oh, okay, we know the liberal epidemic, we're blaming the police, here we go again. How many times have we heard that? That's a common reaction. Believe me, I've been exercising this argument most of my career. And most of that argumentation is given in a project to try to help people who practition against crowds, most notably the police, this understanding. Because it's not the case that the police deliberately did this. They actually sought to try to prevent disorder based on an outdated classical model of the crowd. And our argument is that they need an understanding of these accurate dynamics that are going on in crowd events so that they can make their decisions informed with a proper understanding of the implications of what it is that they do. And if they have that understanding, then they can harness it to manage crowds in ways that don't lead to those kinds of mistakes. But more importantly, if a perception of police illegitimacy is often fundamental to a riot, then by definition, if you can maintain perceptions of police legitimacy, therefore you can stop riots. And forgive me if I'm wrong, but the raison d'etre of public order policing is to prevent riots. So why on earth would they not want to utilise this information to help them in their fundamental uh, project? And I am an academic that believes very, very strongly that we need a rounded approach to the academic project. Our job is not simply to theorise. It is also to connect our theory to the social world around us, to have what we now commonly refer to as impact. And we need to understand that that's a, a responsibility that we have as theoret theoreticians. And for me, that has gone on primarily in the arena of, of football uh, uh, policing, uh, because uh, after the poll tax riot, I tried to influence uh, uh, the agenda around protest policing, but was not uh, 
uh, very sympathetically listened to, as you, could, you probably understand why. Uh, but in the context of football, there was a different agenda because football was causing a significant political embarrassment at the late 90s and early noughties. Um, with English fans uh, causing problems, you'll recall, of course, we've got Heysel um, as a major uh, stadium disaster in 1985, leading to the ban of English uh, club sites for five years and so on. And so prevalent was disorder around English football that we, of course, call it the English disease. And my work was really very much about trying to understand the dynamics of these events from the perspective of crowd psychology because the dominant narrative is that these events were being caused by a convergence of hooligans and fans. But where we were beginning to do our observations of riots involving English fans in international competition, what we were beginning to recognise was that the dynamics of those riots were very, very similar to the dynamics that we'd witnessed in the poll tax riot. That often it was the expectation of violence on the part of the police and the authorities that were creating practices that were constructing the dynamics among uh, England fans uh, that led them to hold identities that were conducive to the escalation uh, of violence. So once we began to understand that, we tried to work to influence uh, the policing practices at an international level, uh, particularly as this uh, was the case around the European Championships in Portugal in 2004. And by this point, the, the work had been uh, funded by the government, uh, funded by the Home Office to undertake this work. Um, we were very successful in influencing uh, the security arrangements around that, uh, uh, around that tournament. Uh, very successful outcomes uh, were, were produced as a consequence that have been structured into international police uh, agreements at the international level on, on how um, a police should orient towards uh, crowds in this kind of context. But by 2009, despite our uh, success in shaping international policing policy and practice at an international level, we were still not making any inroads into British policing. And as late as 2009, public order police commanders in the UK were still being taught Lebonian classical theories of the crowd as their conceptual basis for understanding how crowds worked. And we, we were trying to change that, but we couldn't uh, uh, get any, any traction until Ian Tomlinson died. And this is the thing about how authorities and the state learns about crowds. They wait for disaster, there's political embarrassment, and all of a sudden they open up the door and say, oh, let's have another look at this particular problem, shall we? One of the biggest things I'm trying to do is to get everybody into a position where we stop killing people first before we ask that question, which is an incredibly difficult challenge uh, to achieve uh, for some strange reason. But the death of Ian Tomlinson opened up the door for a debate and a dialogue. And I put this in here just to make a particularly important point to me. This is an article in a police, prof in police professional. It's one of the police professional magazines. I would argue that this article is the most impactful, influential article I have ever written in my life. You will not see that in the ref. That's an irrelevancy in academic terms. And I think just in terms of the objective tensions that we're forced to work in in the higher education sector, we've got to start a conversation about how it is that you go about making impact. And it is not just about academic publications. That there is a project at work here where we need to structure a dialogue and engagement with professionals outside of our discipline. And that is not always conducive uh, to academic publication. Nonetheless, this uh, particular article fed through a series of processes into the government inquiry, into the policing of public order in the UK that grew out of the death of Ian Tomlinson. Now that uh, uh, culminated in this particular uh, document by Her Majesty's Inspector at the Constabulary uh, called Adapting to Protest. There's some really important dimensions to what happened here for British policing. First of all, uh, it was an acknowledgement for the first time uh, that the conceptual understanding of crowds that the police needed to work from was not classical theory, but our identity-based model of, of crowd psychology. So by this point, we're getting formal recognition within the, within the UK. Um, but it's also a narrative about the implications of the Human Rights Act for how the police need to understand how they police crowds. Because, of course, crowds are places where people have rights of freedom of assembly, they have rights of freedom of expression, and they have rights of freedom of consciousness. All rights protected under the European Convention of Human Rights. And that enshrined in the Human Rights Act 
is the lawful requirement that the police have to facilitate and protect those rights. And any intrusion into them is itself a criminal offence. And that's an important thing about the Human Rights Act. And it really does scare me when we hear a narrative that somehow this thing needs to be scrapped. Because it is so fundamental to the reforms and the human rights developments that have occurred in British policing post the death of Ian Tomlinson. Um, but also that that project is born in a particular notion of what we should be as a society and the actions of the police and their intrusions into these rights is fundamental to what it means to be a democracy. So when we look at the violence that the police exercised against demonstrators in the Catalan, we recognise the importance of questioning what the police did there because it is such a fundamental intrusion into democratic rights. So what we're seeing here is... a. a, a, a a converging together of different understandings into disciplinary perspectives that are based on law, they're based on social psychology, and they're based on a kind of philosophy of the nature of democracy and policing within uh, democracies coming together uh, to produce a particular outcome, which was a recommendation that in order to advance in this country, public order policing needed to develop a better way of communicating with people, both to manage the legitimacy of crowd dynamics, both to protect their rights under the European Convention of human rights and to be and retain that fundamental dimension of democracy in our own uh, society. And it's really in that that the Celebrating Impact Prize uh, was generated because my work fed into uh, the production of these officers. And I just want to show you a short video of how all of these things uh, came together. <laughs> My name is Clifford Stott and uh, my area of research focuses on the social psychology of, of crowd behaviour. So you've only got to look to the Arab Spring and look to the Ukraine to understand the significance of what crowd events can become. People get arrested, people get criminalised, police careers can end uh, in, in an instant uh, because of decisions that are made. The work that I do began with an ESRC funded studentship uh, back in 1989 and through that work we began to understand that much of the conflict that we were witnessing in our research was brought about by particularly aggressive forms of policing that set in motion dynamics of escalation in the crowd creating the psychology of a riot police would wheel out the riot squad to show that they had the capacity to, uh, to, to control these crowds. And we fundamentally changed that because what we've shown is that actually crowd dynamics involve the perception of the legitimacy of policing action. And those policing practices are not based around deterrence and fear, they're based around engagement and dialogue. Through the work that we were doing, we were producing results that then enabled us to uh, affect the security planning for the European Championships in Portugal in 2004. And once we'd achieved that impact on policy, we were in a position to apply to the ESRC to generate funds to conduct a major study of the policing of that tournament and the implications of that policing on crowd psychology and behaviour. We developed these new units, police liaison teams or police liaison officers, and from the outset, from planning an operation onwards, they have relationships with people in the crowd, that they can negotiate solutions to those problems, that mean it's much less likely that the police will need or actually deploy units that might then use force, such as dispersal or what has come to be referred to as kettling. What Cliff's research has helped us do is engage with protest groups, particularly protest leaders, in a much more constructive way, which means we need far fewer resources and it's more peaceful and more, more constructive. And it also helps us hold on to the support and consent of the majority on those difficult protests when you get a challenging small group trying to whip it, whip it up into violence. The rest of the crowd understand it and we don't get uh, a domino effect, if you like, where it starts as a small localised incident, the rest of the protests see it as something else, and as a result, we then get significant conflict between police and the protest groups. Mm -hmm. 
We've now seen these reforms in policy. The training for public order commanders nationally has been fundamentally reformed, so all public order commanders now get some input about this crowd psychology and about this research. We have about 60 or so police liaison officers, which has emerged directly from Cliff's research. We have a dedicated sergeant and three constables, we call them the police liaison gateway team, as the name suggests. They are the gateway to negotiation and dialogue with all protest groups. A protest group notifies us they're going to have a protest. The PLT gateway team will be the ones who will then engage them in the first instance, try and build up the, that relationship, that rapport, and then we'll deploy police liaison team officers on the ground when the protest or the gathering or whatever it happens to be actually takes place. This has helped spark other officers think about how could they use research and collaboration with academia in a different way because we need practical solutions we can deploy rather than a theoretical paper five years later and that's what Cliff's done for us. So what we, what we began to see post, uh, I suppose, HMICs adapting to protest was an incorporation of these ideas into practice that fed into what we now see as acknowledged uh, uh, impact and I think it's that impact that underpins the, the, the subsequent recognition by the ESRC of, of the importance of this work across its 50 year history. So it's this relationship between valid theoretical explanation that helps us to build a uh, a theoretical account that has explanatory power and the ability to combine that with a project where those ideas can be implemented into uh, policy and practice. But of course, there's still a long way to go. The, the future it, it still requires ongoing uh, reforms. And uh, where we are now is trying to unlock an opportunity to begin to help police forces internationally to move beyond the idea that these approaches only apply to political protests. Because overwhelmingly across the European footprint, most of our public order policing resources get deployed into the management of conflict in football. And that's particularly true in Sweden, where we're undertaking um, a four-year project looking at the management of uh, football crowds in, in Sweden that we call Enable, Enable Sweden. And the ethos, the ethos of this project is driven around the process of trying to get practitioners to understand uh, the relevance and the value of uh, research evidence. And through that, we're trying to move research beyond the normal structural relation that exists between institutes of research and, and, and clients, that somehow they have a problem, we go along as the experts, we analyse the problem, we come into a lecture theatre like this, we set up a set of slides and we say, there you go, this is our view of the problem. We're trying to overcome that by including practitioners in the research process itself because we believe that that's a route through which that knowledge has greater legitimacy, also is a route uh, through which that knowledge has uh, greater validity because those practitioners have a lot to offer in terms of their ability to analyse uh, the problem that we're trying to understand. But this process is a research process that is moving from our early participant observation into a framework of participant action research to try to construct an opportunity across Europe to bring together police officers and police commanders, policy makers and so on into a common project of trying to understand how we can drive this theory-led, dialogue-based solution forward in an arena where there are many people who, who, who would like to see um, uh, that uh, intervention not be as successful uh, as it otherwise uh, could be. And part of that underpins uh, why we're building the Kiel Policing Academic Collaboration as a framework of bringing practitioners into the process of understanding the problem and working with us um, in not what we call knowledge co-production. Uh, and through that framework to create what we now call Pathways to Impact, where uh, the research excellence that we have here at Kiel in terms of forensics, in terms of criminology, in terms of uh, uh, the, the management school and various other pockets of very important research that goes on here relevant to policing together to create a framework through which that knowledge and expertise can uh, impact and be impacted upon. 
uh, by our uh, stakeholder partners. Um, but our project here, and certainly mine, is not just about practical uh, application of existing theory. It's also helping us now to, uh, again through ESRC funded uh, research, to move our theoretical project on. Because for many, many years we've been focusing very much on what we might call reactive riots, how police intervention uh, creates forms of identity uh, that then uh, lead to changes in the normative structure of a crowd event such that peaceful crowds become violent. Well, in 2011, we all know uh, that that kind of violence spread across the cities of England. But what we began to understand very quickly by looking at that is that many of these riots were not reactive. They were actually what we now call proactive riots, where people mobilised into particular areas of London and began to initiate confrontation as a deliberate act. And our theory is not at this point in a position to begin to understand how that psychology works. And this ESRC-funded funded project uh, has been ongoing now here at Kiel for two years, and we're beginning to uh, produce papers now that are helping to advance our social identity model uh, to build an explanation of the spread uh, of, of those riots in, in 2011. And central to that, then, is this shift towards uh, proactive rioting. But again, um, that analysis is, is, is born out of and holds true to this idea uh, that in order to understand the spread of the 2011 riots, uh, both in pattern, limit and extent, uh, we need to move away from these classical accounts that were writ large of mindless criminality uh, and copycat rioting into an account that understands how identity works and how identity is born, uh, both from social structural relations and also from the dynamics of crowd events uh, that it begin on Saturday outside Tottenham Police Station and then grow and develop uh, across the next four days. And at the heart of this project, then, is the realisation about the future. What is the future for academia? Well, for me, it is about interdisciplinarity. As we see our research councils collapse into a single research council UK, we also see those research councils orienting towards strategic challenges. The impact agenda is there precisely precisely because of the block grant. And the block grant has to be justified. And it is justified because we produce research that makes meaningful social impact on the challenging issues of our society. Now, I'm 52 years old, and I don't recall, in my lifetime, looking at a society that is in more crisis. Look at what is going on in the world around us. How is our academic research and theory going to engage in meaningful ways that make meaningful impact on those social challenges? And we have to begin to orient towards that challenge. And those explanations do not reside in outdated notions of disciplinarity. They reside in constructing the architecture of interdisciplinary collaboration to combine elements of knowledge into new transdisciplinary perspectives that help us to make meaningful impacts on contemporary social challenges uh, like riots, like conflict um, and other very, very meaningful uh, social challenges. So for me, that's an oversight of, of, of my career, its development, its past, its history, its connection um, and its future orientation. I hope that that overview was worth turning up for here tonight um, and kept you awake for this uh, roughly 45 minutes. Um, and thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take questions.